I literally have solved, I think, a couple thousand puzzles in the last and, month. I've been doing so many of those fucking and it things. And it shows because you basically guessed every move in this game, which is something that I would not have even come close to doing with you earlier. I would give you, like, this checkmate in one puzzle, maybe even, like, a, like two weeks ago. But now I'm showing you the entire game and asking you to guess all sorts of different moves. So give yourself a little bit of credit. Hey, John. But, you know... And the puzzles that you solved, trust me, the speed with which you're finding these tactics is, I mean, it's not even close. And just the speed that you're playing with is actually faster as well. Well, thanks, man. It's all because of a good teacher. Like uh, you genuine, like no memes and shit. You actually are like an extremely good teacher. 100%. I, appreci I appreciate that. Well, you know what they say, good student, good teacher. So you make my job easy. <laughs> thanks. I've never heard anyone say that, but I'm going to assume it's a real saying. Thanks, man. <laughs> I don't think it's real. I think it's, it's bullshit, just like most things I say. Yeah, it sounded um, like actual garbage that you uh, made up. Well, I mean, I have it framed on my wall, but thank you for insulting my wall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shitty wall. So I want to show you one of the most famous games of the 19th century. Um, and it's a game that, that I think is, first of all, just amazingly brilliant. You'll enjoy the tactics, I think, immensely. And it'll give us an opportunity to segue from just me rehashing a couple of principles that you adhere to, to broadening your understanding and actually putting your understanding into practice. I think you now have the tools to appreciate how grandmasters play chess, which is something that I've kind of been setting you up for. So we didn't do this earlier because you would have looked at this game and said, all right, big shit. Like, OK, this guy played this game. What do I learn from it? Now you can now actually can benefit from it, it because you have that foundation already built. Yes. Um, so me. let me just grab my iPad so I can pull up the game. And I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you to an analysis board. And I'll paint backstory behind this game first. One moment. So let me just pull it up. How does that sound? I mean, again, if you if you want to veto that, you're welcome to. <laughs> Sounds fine to me, man. All right. I'm always up for the classic Naraditsky lore session. Uh, yeah, there is definitely some backstory behind this game. This game was played in... Okay, let me first invite you to an analysis board. No, I'm not going to put a space chat. Um, Turbo Christo. Just invited you. All right. So most people think that they know which game I'm going to show you, but they actually don't. Um... This game was played in the year 1895 um, in a small English seaside town called Hastings, which, thanks for the bits, uh, man, which basically is just like a tiny, like, bar-hopping pub town. But as with all major chess tournaments, they're usually held in shitholes. Like, the bigger the shithole of a town it is, the more likely that a very high-profile international chess tournament is held there. Um, there are Plus, many... I won't delve into the reasons for that, but... You know, um, it just, there just does exist that um, relationship. But anyways, um, this tournament uh, was the, basically the strongest tournament ever held in the 20th century. It was held every year in this town of Hastings. And all of the top chess players of the day converged on that tiny town, which by 19th century standards was huge because the logistical nightmare of that was, as you can understand, immense. So this game was played by a guy named Wilhelm Steinitz, who at the time was the world chess champion. He was also the first official world champion. And his opponent, and like you cannot make these names up. Like I feel like only chess players have these names. His opponent was a guy named Kurt von Bardeleben, whose that name- That sounds like a Bond villain, yeah. Yeah, Bond, yeah. he sounds like, a, his name sounds a lot more intimidating than Steinitz, but he was actually a lot worse at chess than Steinitz. Um, and Kurt von, von Bart 11 was a bit of a, um, how do you put it, a bit of a pressure cooker. He had a bit of a short fuse. So there was a incident that happened at the end of this game that I'll get to. But let's get to the game. So Steinitz had the white pieces. Von Bart 11 has the black pieces. So you can paint yourself that picture. There are chain smoking cigarettes, you know, leaning back in their chairs. And here they go. Steinitz goes E4. Um, and the most popular okay. opening... Yeah, that's it. That, did you enjoy the game, Charlie? Please tell me you liked the game. <laughs> I feel like I learned a lot already, Daniel. I mean, here von Bardeleben 
saw the power of Steinitz's move, and he simply put his king down. I mean, he said, I cannot take this guy's mastery any further. <laughs> it's e4. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm still recovering from fuck? looking at this move. Now you have to pay money to look at every move in this game, including this one, because of, how, because of its power. So Vard 11 plays e5. And up until, I would say, the 1950s, e5 was almost exclusively the move played against e4, at which point the Sicilian defense, which is c5, kind of replaced it in popularity. Now c5 is the most popular move at the top. e5, and the opening is going to be familiar to you. It is the move that you tend to play in this position. The Italian defense, what move did Steinitz play? c3. S uh, so that's the four knights. Uh, the Italian is bishop c4. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No problem. So knight c3 is entirely possible, but bishop c4, bishop c5 was played. Now you in this position either develop your knight or you play the move t3. But I'm going to introduce you to a slightly different opening setup. Now I'm going to make this move on the board, and you should be familiar with its idea because you've seen this move before. C3. That's the move Steinitz plays. Now could you decode the idea of this move? Yeah, he doesn't want the knight on d4. Number one, and he's planning central expansion with what move? Pretty straightforward. I mean, it all revolves around that square you just mentioned. Oh, so I, I didn't have push to talk on. I was, I was saying oh, no pawn to d4, pawn to d4. Exactly. He wants to play the move pawn to d4. This is actually the main move in this position. And we're going to go quite fast through the first stage of the game, and we're going to reach the fun part because it's all theory. Knight f6 by von Bart 11. Uh, developing his knight. Stop me if any move is illogical or I'm going too fast. d4 by Steinitz. Uh, occupying the center, attacking the bishop. Von Bart 11 takes the pawn, and which way do you think Steinitz recaptures here? He takes with the pawn. Of course, to preserve the integrity of his center. Now, obviously, this move later became the most popular move in this position. It's called the Kaspara Fischer Gambit. Um, and it's like a positional queen sacrifice, actually. But that only happened in the 1990s. Why is that popular, though? It's a queen for two pieces. Does that work? It's actually a queen for... Just kidding. I'm, I'm fucking with you now. This move just launders a queen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, I, I love doing that. Uh, I've actually made some... Okay, don't feel bad because I've made some, like, very strong players believe some total bullshit. Um, just even, to fuck them if you ever saw them in a tournament. That's genius. Well, I'm actually pretty good at keeping a straight face, and like at chess camps and stuff. When I'm teaching the even the highest groups, I'll like sell some total BS about some queen sacrifice, and I'll pretend that this is like hot shit nowadays, and they all buy it. You know, they eat it up like a sponge. <laughs> they trust you, <laughs> those fools. How yeah. could they possibly if they just knew what I was up to in my spare time? I mean, especially what I was up to with you. But fortunately, <laughs> that is kept under wraps. Um, of course, yeah. So in any case, he takes d4 by Steinitz, and Bernard 11 gives a check on b4 with his bishop, which Steinitz blocks with the most natural developing move. Which move is that? He brings his knight to d2. Uh, that's a little passive. Can he bring his knight out to a more active square? Uh, he brings it out to c3. Bingo, knight c3. Okay. Now, it appears, and we won't dwell for too long on this because this is still in the realm of opening theory, it appears that Steinitz has blundered upon. What yep. do I mean by that statement? How? E4. Well, no, E4 is not hanging, but... Are you sure uh, about that? Because notice the pin. So E4, uh, right. in fact, is hanging. Right, 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 and, right. And, and this is a classic gambit. A gambit is when you sack a pawn in order to gain something in return, such as development. So here, Black has kind of forsaken his queenside development, and instead he goes pawn grabbing, and he opens up an avenue to his king. So just from a conceptual standpoint, does it make sense that a move like this is very risky? The pawn sack or what he did? Well, taking, the pawn. if you capture the pawn, does, does the riskiness yeah. of such a move make sense? Right, so Bard 11 did yeah. not take the pawn. And there's a known kind of continuation. This is still theory. You can take the pawn, um, but the line go, goes on. Instead, when Bard 11 plays d5. And after e takes d5, has he just himself now blundered a pawn? No. Well... Yeah, you can't defend that. So, how many attackers does this pawn have? Pawn has bishop on it, and that's it. Okay, and how many defenders does this pawn have? Or, how, has, I mean, from Black's perspective, how many yeah, pieces are attacking him? The knight and the queen. So, can you take that pawn? Yeah. 
Absolutely. And yeah. I like that you didn't say the knight because the knight is spin. So knight takes d5. Right. And this is a very Manka-esque construction because it's like the bishop holding the world on its shoulders. If it fails in its responsibility to pin the knight, you're going to lose your queen. But it's like, you know, pilots flying a plane. You know, like the margin of error at the top becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why I'm teaching you openings to start that are very solid. It's hard to fuck up. Position like this, you mix up the move order, you take on d5 at the wrong moment. You see what I'm saying? And you might end up blundering yeah. your queen. But at the top, this is like the theoretical line. Takes, takes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were going to ask something. Sorry. I was going to say, so if he did take that queen, like let's say he did take a bishop, now he's got his queen at d5, don't you just push up the a pawn and you're winning a bishop or the queen if he fucks up? Well, that's a good point, but he won't fuck up. He'll take the knight with check, remove yeah, I mean, the attacker of the queen, ruin white's pawn structure slightly, and then he'll castle. And then he'll okay. bring his own bishop out to g4, and he has a very commanding position because he'll have a pin and he'll have a nice queen on d5, which Makes is basically sense. unassailable by any pieces. Um, okay, that so sense. that would not be a very advisable continuation. And Steinitz and Sedge's castles. And this is another pawn sacrifice, by the way. And as a tactical warm-up for you, this is, again, not something I would have asked you even a little bit earlier. But if Bartoleben now takes the pawn on c3, Steinitz has a very nice little tactic that wins the pawn back. And it uses, I'm going to give you this one hint, the undefended nature of the bishop on c3. This is a two-move slash three-move combination, depending on how you look at it. Well, the first thing I was looking at is a way to win the bishop with a check, but I don't really see that... Uh... The only thing I see for that is pushing queen, e2, check, king falls back. And you can't deliver a second check in a position that can win the bishop, right? Um, so you say that again after queen, e2, check? Then the, he, either he wouldn't block with the queen. He blocks with the knight or he moves his king, but I, I wouldn't know where to continue it from here. Right, so, so you're, you're, you're buying up against the right kind of problem, which is that it looks like you can't fork the king and the bishop. So in right. these situations... You need to start thinking about ways to bring the king onto a square where it can then be forked to the bishop. So that's uh, so the then, mechanism that you should be looking so for. That's what, okay, so then we're taking the pawn on f7 with the bishop to get Bingo. the king out, and we're putting him in check, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Queen b3 check, and now if you compare the safety of the kings, it's clear that white is on top here. Nice. Right. So these types of things, you know, I kind of look for automatically. Whenever I see a piece that's number one undefended and number two right in my grill, that's like fork, freaking fork city. Right, because the probability that I'll be able to check that piece on one of many squares increases, and the probability that I can use one of my pieces to bring his king out is also usually quite high. So if, if we had these two moves included, and it was white to move here, um, could you do the same thing in this position? Could yeah, you just, you just yeah, you just take on h on h7, and right? Where do you, and and where do you check? check? You check on, nope, yep, never mind, protected by queen. Well, you're right so far. No, 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 no. So it's C2. C2. Oh, right. C2 or D3, and then you win the bishop back. Very good. Yeah. So that's why Bart 11 doesn't take that pawn. Instead, he defends his knight with bishop E6. Steinitz brings out his bishop on C1 to its most active square, which is what? That's going all the way over there to G5. Correct. Von Bart 11 brings his own bishop back to contest Steinitz's bishop. Is this making sense so far? We're getting to the cool part, I promise. <laughs> mm -hmm. And here, standard. Steinitz initiates a humongous monstrosity of a trade, which takes off basically all the modern pieces off the board except for one knight. First, he takes on d5. Then he takes on d5 again. Now he takes on e7. And the question then becomes, why has he initiated all of this all to get a boring position in which black is about to castle and then black is going to be in excellent shape. But the key word in that statement is black is about to castle. If you're looking at this position for, from white's perspective, you have one temporary advantage and you want to try to make that advantage permanent. What advantage is that? You have a diagonal you can look at on A4. Yes, but what broadly does that speak to? What weakness does Black currently have, which he hopes to solve on the next move? He has that knight that is keeping the king from uh, check on like a rook at E1. The knight's 
The knight can be pinned. The knight can be pinned, and that's exactly what Steinitz does. And even more broadly, the king is uncastled, right? White's mm -hmm. king is castled, black's king is uncastled. And when you're evaluating positions, you know, generally speaking, the king's safety has to be the number one factor you're looking for. Whose king is safer? No, well, it's absolutely white's king right now. Right. And when your opponent's king is uncastled and he's threatening to castle, you have to try to find various creative techniques to prevent your opponent's king from seeking shelter. So the rest of this game revolves around white's desire to keep this king in the center and eventually checkmate it, and black's desire to basically shelter this king at all costs. That's where things get super fun. Okay, von Bird 11 plays f6. He covers this e5 square so that white cannot jump out there with his knight. Steinitz continues to put pressure on this knight. How? How do you attack this knight one more time with one of your pieces? Not sure I can hear you. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you weren't saying anything. Oh yeah, think, 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 think. Sorry, my headphones made the sound that they're low on battery, so I didn't, I didn't know if, if they had died. Thinking is strictly forbidden. Yeah. Uh, as long as you need. Sorry, I was just joking. The only other attacker that I can see bringing into this is stacking, so bringing the queen to e2 to also attack the knight. Bingo. That's exactly what you want to do. Okay. Stack, simple chest, attacking the knight, forcing black's queen to finally leave its dominant post on d5 and assigning it this defensive role on d7. And this is where it gets tough, because it appears that, well, what is black's plan in this position? How is he going to extricate himself? He's going to go king f7. He's going to bring his rook to e8, and then he's going to what's called manually castle. That's when you castle without actually castling. Because if you castle, then that drops the knight on e7, right? So you have to keep this knight defended, bring the rook to e8, and then get the king to g8. And if black achieves all of that, he is going to be completely fine. So white's time to do something is very limited. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, he has to look at a way to stop f7, which is... Right, and Steinitz is able to, to kind of do that um, by playing rook a to c1. And his idea is that he wants to meet the move king f7. And this is where it gets... Now, Bard 11 should have still played king f7, but he made an oversight. Stein has had in mind a quote-unquote fork here, forking the king to a pawn. Can you find this fork? Keeping in mind why he might have played the move rook ac1. This move should, it should serve as a hint. Is it bringing the is it what I was thinking initially, which was bringing the queen to c4 for the check, and then you're attacking? Okay, that's exactly right. And what I, I was think, looking for a rook move. Yeah, so queen c4 is right. Checking the queen, checking the pawn, but black can defend both at the same time with white clever little freaking bastard of a move. Well, just pushing that pawn up, right? Well, you're in check. I mean, I know that the great Charlie is above defending against checks, <laughs> but you know you defend it. You, know, you defend it with the queen then on d5, right? Protected by the knight as well. So this move is, is, is shitty for several reasons. First of all, you don't actually defend the pawn, which oh, was your right. initial goal. Second of all, you blunder your queen. This knight on e7 is overloaded. It's defending the queen, but it's also under pressure. So you can take out you this knight, take taking, yeah. the, taking the legs out, out from the queen. Right. But you're Fuck. close. You see the right square. Sorry, I just that was, that was mean. But this will make you no, find no. the right move. Yeah, it's bringing the knight there instead. Though. Exactly, bringing the knight to d5 and simultaneously defending c7. Something that some people miss... And, you know, I'm sure you don't, you're not one of them. But some people suggest, oh, they think you can take on c7. Oh, but isn't the knight pinned? Remember that when you move with the pinned piece, you also relinquish the pin. So pins are, in your mind, should be very impermanent things. They should be things that you exploit as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, so, like, sometimes in your games, you have to have that ticking time clock in the back of your mind when you've let's say pinned his knight you have maybe one or two moves to attack that pinned piece before he unpins himself not always but that's just something you should bear in mind pins are extremely temporary tactical things that you should try to efficiently maximize the potential of mm -hmm. makes sense okay so bard 11 um not being you know 
quite as tactically advanced as Steinitz plays the move c6, which is redundant. I think he simply missed this move knight c5 against king f7. And here Steinitz finds a brilliant idea that rips open files and squares for his pieces. And this idea follows one of the most paradoxical principles in, I would say, all of chess. I might have introduced this to you earlier. It's a pretty advanced principle, which is that pawn breakthroughs usually occur on the most well-protected square that your opponent has. That is just a almost freaking universal rule in chess. When you want to break through with a pawn, you do it on the least likely square. And which square am I talking about right now? And which pawn breakthrough am I talking about right now? Well, the most defended pawn on the board right now is that c6 pawn, so you're just pushing up d4 to d5. Bingo. It's defended thrice. Well, the knight isn't really defending it because it's pinned. Because it's pinned. But you can kind of understand logically why this principle operates, because it's almost like, you know, it's like that, that thing where you can pull out the bottom piece of paper from a huge stack of books. Like my English teacher used to do that when collecting our homework. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think I have no freaking clue, I'm talking out of my ass as usual, why that works, but for some reason it seems similar to me. Like, all of your opponent's pieces are trained on one square. And then this is like a big F you. Basically putting a piece onto that square so all of his pieces are now, like, unemployed. Does that kind of make sense? I makes feel sense, like that was yeah. a bad analogy. But No, I get it. You've, you've, like, removed the thing that his pieces were meant to do. Now he has to put a pawn on d5 because he can't take this with his queen. Why not? You lose the game. You lose the game to checkmate. And this accomplishes two things for white. Number one, it opens a file. Which file? C. And now you see how good Steinitz was. He anticipated this when playing rook c1. He freaking calculated this, and that's why he put the rook there. Partially. Partially was to discourage king f7, but partially was that he thought the line, the file would open. And second of all, you have now opened up a beautiful square for the only white piece that's currently not doing anything. Which square and which piece, obviously, am I referring to? Beautiful central blockading square. Are we talking about the knight bringing it over to d4? Exactly. Yeah. And you might look at this move and say, what the hell does it accomplish? First of all, notice the umbrella technique, using the pawn of your opponent as a shelter. That is actually a common little device. Black would now like to get rid of this freaking pawn, so at least the queen would make contact with that square. So sometimes your opponent's pawns are actually good for you in that way. Now, do you see the threat that white now has created? If black makes an empty move, you have a classic distraction sacrifice, distraction tactic, I should say, using this knight on d4. Which yeah, tactic? Going right to c6. Very right. close, but remember I have a pawn on c6. So you have the right idea in mind, but it's not the right square. You do well, have to make no, contact what? with the knight. No, but now he takes with the pawn. And then you'd take with the rook, you'd take with the, he'd take with the queen, I imagine. Well, he wouldn't have I to. I imagine, right? uh, but what if your opponent isn't an idiot? But very nice <laughs> yeah, that you right. actually calculated it all the way, <laughs> but I would now move my king away to f7. Or better yet, right. you have now allowed me to castle, my friend. Because now if you take my knight, yeah. joke's on frickin' you who left that rook on c6. What genius did that? Oh, right. Turbo fist. Yep, yep, yep. So you're very I, close, actually. Which <laughs> move is a refinement on that? Uh, so in this, uh, he's threatening to bring the knight over there to e6 then, right? Because then at e6, he can cover it. Good mm -hmm. move, good move. You're threatening, you're, you're winning. But I specifically want yeah. you... I, I didn't discourage you from finding a similar idea to that one, did I? Um, if I did, I'm, I'm sorry. But you actually had the right idea of of making contact with the knight on e7. You just have to do it from another angle. Is it throw Well, it can't be putting the queen there, right? Because, I mean, nope. you it's don't a knight move. trade queens. It's yeah. a knight move. Um, so you, it's just are we just attacking that knight there for f5 then? Yep. And the idea is, again, I can't okay. take with my queen. And you're, you you've gotten so much better at identifying squares that seem to be defended but are not actually defended. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of people would throw yeah. this out immediately. Oh, we're defended by the queen. But the queen is also overloaded. It's defending the knight. So on the next move, you just win a piece here. You win the knight. Okay, that makes sense then. So von Bart 11 is not an idiot, obviously. He sees all of this. He goes king f7, and finally he unpins himself. But now this knight on d4, well, and now why does knight f5 no longer work? Simple question, but... This well, because I mean, you can just take with the knight. Right, he's unpinned himself. But yeah. Steinitz finds a second use for his knight, and you've proposed this move before, knight to e6. 
Okay. And this knight on e6 just is a bone in black's throat. You can just see how good it is. It's preparing moves like rook c7, and you can see in what dire condition black king is, right? Yeah. Bart 11 swings his rook over to c8, desperately trying to stop white's rook from penetrating to c7. And this is exactly where Steinitz strikes on the other side of the board. Notice that black has removed a defender from the king side, and that is now exactly where Steinitz presses in the knife. But he does it in a very smart way. Remember what black's idea is. Black wants to, to tuck his king away on g8. So prevent him from doing that by making a threat. Because I see a lot of people he, in the chat yeah. going for the tempting move, but you want to go for the correct one here. So what I initially saw was bringing the queen over to h5, put in check, mm -hmm. but he wants to go to that square anyway, Bingo. so he'll just protect it. And that's the tempting move, and you refuted it correctly. Yeah. So... But you're thinking in the right direction of the board. It's not always about giving a check, though. It's about the threat, perhaps, of checkmate. Yeah. I just don't see how to cut that escape route off with the knight. Because uh, if, like, if you do a move like bringing the knight to g5 and he takes with the pawn... Uh, right, that's sort of too much check. of a price to pay, though. Don't think it's of stopping worth... a move physically. Think of a move such that if he plays king g8, he gets checkmated. Think of it that way. Because stopping a threat, I don't literally mean always physically preventing him from going there. I also mean making a stronger threat that forces him to divert his attention. And you can also arrive at this by asking yourself, now which piece has served its duty and is now somewhat obsolete? I mean... Yeah, so is it? are we looking at that rook on c1? Uh, not... We can't really do anything in relationship with the king side. We need to act very fast because if he plays king g8, we have, as I said, only one tempo here, right? We have one opportunity to make something happen of his king. As soon as he tucks it away, the party time is over. So you need to use your queen. I'm going to give you a hint. It is a queen move, but it's not queen h5 check. Oh, Jesus. It's just bringing the queen over to g4 and then threaten to go to g7 for yeah, checkmate. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And if he goes king g8, right, we take on g7 yeah, with checkmate. Yeah. Do you notice any undefended pieces that black has internally? Anything that's undefended, yeah, it, maybe x-rayed, maybe? Kind of, sort of. Uh, H-pawn's undefended, but we're x-raying his queen as well with that knight. Nice, and that's exactly what Steinitz exploits on the next move. Bart 11 defends against checkmate with g6, and now Steinitz exploits... He he checks with the knight, and then he takes queen, right? Exactly, except Bart 11 being freaking Kurt von Bart 11. He's not about to give away his queen. I mean, he makes a big dick move, king e8. Um, <laughs> but really, cool. he's defending his queen. And this is where yeah. Steinitz launches one of the most famous combinations of all time. Um, and what Steinitz notices here is the fact that not only is the queen semi-undefended, this rook on c8, do you see that it's being x-rayed? by two of white's pieces. Yeah. So all that stands in this rook's way, all that stands as its protection, is this flimsy little queen on d7. Except you have just the way to distract this queen from its defensive post with what move? This is where Steinitz comes full circle. It's not as easy as I just painted, but... Is it taking the knight with the rook? It is. Very nice. Okay. And if he takes with the queen, you do what? You take the rook with the rook, he takes back with the rook, Bingo. you take with the queen. Exactly. And the problem is if he takes with the king, then only the king is attached to the queen, and you basically separate this king um, from the queen. So basically here you go rook to e1 check, um, king to d8, you give another check on e6 with the knight. He has to go into the path of the rook, now some good practice using the discover check, which I think you sometimes tend to struggle with. How do you actually win this queen on d7 using the discover check? Where do you put the knight? So what we need to do is stop the king from being able to go to d6, right? So he can't protect the queen any longer. Or we need to attack the queen with the knight. That's an alternate method. Right, fuck, yeah, I thought too far, so it's going mm -hmm. to c5. Very good, so, <clears throat> or you can taunt him by going to f8. You could take your knight here, but you still take his queen. But knight c5 is the best move, because you actually keep your knight on top of everything. Then right. you take the queen. But when Bart 11 actually finds a brilliant defensive idea, he goes king f8. 
which looks like a total desperation move until you notice that White also has a crippling weakness in his position. What tactical feature is Von Bart 11 exploiting here? Why can't Steinus just take rank. bingo, the back rank? And the back rank is a very hard problem to solve on the fly. It just so happens that White also needs to attend to the problems of his queen. Um, thank you for the 15 bucks, Profernity. He has to attend to his queen and his rook. You see how much shit is going on with White. And now he yeah. has the back rank to attend to. But Steinitz finds just the way to do that. He starts with a check on f7, okay? Again, if you take with the queen, you take you the queen, queen, right? Careful, I'm oh, toying right. with back you here. Rank. Back rank. So what do you actually you need, need to rank. take here? You need to take the rook. Again, you take the rook twice. Right, and Now right, they play right, this yeah. dance. Von Bart 11 moves his king to g8. And here Steinitz makes an amazing freaking move. Try to find it. It's the same theme that his last move was, but it's a beautiful visually... Visually beautiful move. It's not just pushing the rook up, is it? It's not going rook f8. You're very close. Now, rook f8 check is a very devious little move. You want him to take with the rook, right? And then you can take the yeah. queen. But he's mm -hmm. going to take with the king. And now we have the same problem. We're just missing the rook. So, again, we have the problem with the back rank. So what yeah, should you okay. keep in mind here? First of all, the fact that, again, don't forget, this queen on d7, if it leaves this square, you'll be able to take you, his rook with your rook. So, right, but we... But we can't do that yet, because if we take the queen right now, he takes our Mates. rook and we lose. So, think of it this way. It's another distraction sacrifice, which attempts to distract this queen from the d7 square. So, you're getting close with the move rook f8, but you're trying to distract the wrong piece. You need to try to distract that queen on d7, setting the mouse trap for the queen. Is it just bringing the rook to e7, then? But that's not check. Yeah, so we'd still lose, right? Mm. It needs to be yeah, a check. Yeah. You're very close, but it needs to be a check. And your brain is like, this move cannot be right. It looks too crazy. It puts the rook in, under fire of like 18 pieces. <laughs> but that's exactly yeah. what makes this game brilliant. So there's only two checks you can deliver, which is f8 and then g7. So is which it one is it? It is. Look at this move. Okay. And what's the idea? Let's unpack this for a second. If he takes with the queen, the refutation is familiar. We take the rook. Yeah, rook. Queen, but here's yeah. the brilliance of this move. If he takes with the king, a very important thing has occurred. The king has now moved from the 8th rank to the 7th rank, which means we can now do what? Which we could not do earlier due to the back rank being weak. Well, what I initially saw was just bringing the knight for an e6 check, which could win the queen, but that's not going to happen. Right, so you're not asking yourself, how has the position changed? Yeah. You need to reevaluate whether moves that used to be impossible are now possible, because the position has changed in some way, and in fact it has. The king has gone from g8 to g7, which enables us to do something we couldn't previously do. You, it, you're like traumatized by this move, so you're not even considering it. I told you this move was impossible in your brain. You're like, I can never take free queens for the rest of my life. Yeah, well, so it is just taking the queen? But that's check now. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, that, I see what you mean now. So that's why we, we goad the king to g7. It's now check. And that's one of the key principles okay. that I want to illustrate with this game. It's not usually shown for the sake of, in, from, of revealing this principle, but... I still think it's super important. You see what I'm saying now by reevaluating how the position has changed. Whenever there is any sort of yeah. tension in the position, there's a hanging queen that you cannot take for whatever reason, you need to keep asking yourself, can I take the queen now? Can I change the circumstances such that I can take the queen? Can I take the queen on the next move? Because people kind of just forget that the situation has changed. They get used to the position, okay? Yeah, that makes sense. So Bart 11 goes to the corner because that is the last remaining move. And now Steinitz plays yet another move that exploits the same principle. This one you'll be able to find quite quickly. What does he yeah, do? He, did, he just takes the pawn. He takes the pawn. And here Bart 11 snuffed out his cigar and actually stormed out of the playing hall without resigning <laughs> and without shaking hands. Absolutely true story. I told you he was known as a bit of a... Um, tempestuous for his tempestuous character. And according to the official game annotations... And I'm reading from right now, as Steinitz 
And this, you can tell by the language when this was written. I should probably read it in that old newsreel British accent, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah, yeah. demonstrated immediately afterward, there is a mate in 10 moves which can only be averted by ruinous loss of material. And Winston Churchill showed the variation as follows. King G8. And it looks like we can keep playing Rig Around the Rosie here forever, but the reality is we've taken that pawn on H7, so the situation has changed. We give a check on G7. He goes to H8, but because we've taken this pawn, we have opened up the H file, and what piece can we now put on that H file? We just put that queen in there, We baby. put that queen in there. He has to take our rook with the king, and now we mount the final invasion against this king. Which check do we deliver with our queen? We're going right to h7. Bingo. Now we go to h8. We go to g7. We hunt the king. And it's mate in one of several ways. King e8 is the most resilient defense. Check on g8. We, we're using the staircase method here. How do we complete the staircase? We, we keep approaching the king with our queen. Use this knight on g5. It defends a square into which the queen can now move to. Oh, that's going to f7. Bingo. Yep. King d8. Continue that staircase. So now we're delivering a check on f8, right? Bingo. Forcing queen e8. Now we have a checkmate in two moves that is as brilliant as it is elegant. And what's fitting about this checkmate is at the end of it, all three remaining pieces are rewarded for their staying power because they all cooperate in perfect symphony to deliver the mate. Each piece, the knight, the queen, or the rook, are necessary components of this checkmating idea. Mate and two, white to play. Okay. Does it start with taking the pawn at f6 with the queen Not to deliver quite, that check? Because then he can block with his own queen. You need to use oh, right. a piece. It's going knight first, then Bingo. e6. Also, almost, it's knight f7. Wait, why knight f6? Because he, he still if, can't take it, though. If knight e6, he goes king, king up to d7, though, and you don't have that, that final blow. Your knight is now hanging. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So knight f7 brings under control a second square onto which you can now move the queen. Which square is that? That's going right to d6. And this is checkmate. Right. Okay. Okay. So Bart 11 yeah. saw all of that. You can see that these guys were good. He, he trusted that Stein had saw all of it. So he actually stormed out of the playing hall without finishing the game. And that is the game Stein is Bart 11, Hastings 1895. One of, I would say, probably the, most, the 20 most famous games of all time. But it's actually not shown as commonly anymore, even though it's one of my favorite games. Nice. And it just shows you a lot. It shows you how good these people were, even like 100 and whatever, 30 years ago. And it shows you much, much more importantly the urgency inherent in a lot of chess positions. Like as soon as you see a defect that your opponent has, you need to first of all pay attention to it. Things like an uncastled king, things like a small defect in pawn structure, an undefended piece. Steinitz basically exploited all of it, you know, turning from that uncastled king to the undefended queen, to the undefended rook, to attacking weak pawns with his queen and his knight. Notice, by the way, the tandem, the queen and the knight. Remember what I told you about it. Yeah, strongest combination. Strongest combination of pieces known to man. And Steinitzik used it to, to checkmate. And this move, rook a to c1, involving every single piece in the attack. The more pieces yeah. are playing, the better. Yeah, go ahead. So, now, if you were in this position, how quickly would you recognize this line coming out? Because this seems like something that I can't even imagine you would think of this deep, right? Like... So it started where I think he probably started to see like a line that deep was C1 to prepare to open that file. Or where do right. you think like so, you would start to recognize? In so far as I can, and I can't tell you for sure because I don't know. And, and it was very common at that time to ham yourself up. So Steinitz might very well have said, and I saw the entire line until move 4D when I played rook AC1 because I am so cool. Mm -hmm. But the reality was, no, you fucking didn't. So I think when you play, when he played rook ac1, he probably saw up until knight d4, or he might he might have seen up until knight e6. And then when he played queen g4, my guess is he saw up until rook takes c7, and he saw that he had at least a draw, right? A draw because you can keep checking the king ad nauseum. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you find at least a draw, you can go for that line safe in the knowledge that if you don't find a win then you're gonna make the drop. But that's where intuition comes in. Steinitz used his intuition to conclude that essentially because he has so many pieces in the attack, like he must have some sort of a win here. He trusted his own knowledge about the game of chess to almost go into this line. And then when he reached this line, that's where he saw 
this idea of opening up the h file and then driving the king. Um, sorry, that's not the right way. This one and this one, driving the king to g7. And already at this point, he had calculated until the end of the game. So I think it occurred in three steps. Step one was this rook c1 idea. Step two was the sacrifice of the rook on e7. And step three was the final combination. So it wasn't all okay. at once, I think, in other words. Makes sense. Um, so that was that. What, what are your thoughts about your first sort of full-on classical game? Yeah, I, a, that's a lot of very complex ideas, a lot of thinking really deep that I guess I'm not too used to. And then again, uh, another thing that I've recognized that I struggled with even in this recap here, knowing the order of things, knowing the right moves but not when to make them. Right. So I guess I need to really recognize when to make a move and when not to. So can you give when me an example of, of what, so I get a better context of, because I think I know what you mean by that, but could you find a moment in this game where you would struggle deciding on the order of things? Sorry, not to put you on the spot, just so I get a better <laughs> sense so we can work on this maybe in the future. So recognizing that E6, I said E6 far too early. You'd play E6 when the king is on F7. I said play E6 when king was still on A8, E8. Or E8. Oh, you mean knight E6? Yeah. Um, no, but knight D4, he did play knight E6 actually almost immediately afterward. So like here, he did go knight E6. He went 94, 96, but you did suggest that 96 might have been a threat, whereas the real threat was knight f5. But that's not really a big problem. I can see why you would be attracted by this move. But the, 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 the way that you can actually think about order in chess is that you want to make the moves that exploit the most temporary advantage first. So what does that mean? If your opponent is uncastled and he's threatening to castle, and you're choosing between a way to stop him from castling or maybe a way to improve the position of one of your pieces, you know, you gotta do the, the thing that's gonna escape you first. So first stop him from castling, and then you can work on improving your pieces. So in your mind, you gotta ask yourself, okay, what is the most urgent priority in this position? We can work on that for sure. I could prepare some training positions. I realize that that is a hard thing to do in chess. I struggle with that as well. But from a general perspective, I think that's the mentality you should keep in mind. I know that's very general, so we'll de we're definitely sense. going to work on this. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And then the other thing is chasing down the checkmate, seeing the checkmate possibility, but not knowing the order to make the moves. Like I said, taking the pawn with the queen, which wouldn't have been a checkmate. It would have given him an, an extra escape square. Instead right. Of delivering a check with the knight. Oh, you mean here? Yeah, so the thing is, and, and this is something you, you, you learn also with experience, like... When you're already in a situation like this where you smell the checkmate, you smell that it's very, very near at hand, you basically need to have the line calculated until the end. There is a point at which you cannot rely on your gut instinct to, you know, to, to, to basically find the right move. Because if you do rely on your gut instinct, you're going to see like five different tempting checks. And all of them are equally tempting. So in a situation like this, you would need to calculate or at least try to calculate at least several moves ahead. Okay, thank you, Fen Bindle. Because I feel like in your mind, you took this pawn with check and you thought this move has got to be powerful because I'm taking the pawn with check. Right. But you didn't emphasize the question, okay, how can black defend against this check? Then you would see the move queen e7. And at this point, it becomes clear that the king now has several escape squares opened up. And yeah, also and think... He's attacking my knight. Right, and you can think in terms of squares. Like, think in terms of which squares does the king have, like, right now. Okay, well, it has this square. How do I craft the situation such that he has the least number of escape squares? This move does come to mind because it limits the king's escape only to the move queen e8. And now you just, the more you solve, this is a line that you'll just see. I mean, I don't have any rational way to come up with this sequence of two moves, but by solving checkmate puzzles, you simply yeah. get better at spotting the stuff instinctually, I would say.